Welcome everybody to our monthly Blockchain Commons uh, Gordian Developer Community Meeting. Um, this is for the month of April. Uh, just to quickly recap, what is Blockchain Commons? Uh, well, we're a community interested in self-sovereign control of digital assets and identity. And in fact, we'll have uh, representatives from uh, a variety of different communities here today about that. And that's part of what we do is we're bringing stakeholders together to collaboratively develop interoperable infrastructure, in particular around wallets. And I really want to design decentralized solutions where everybody wins. And as such, Blockchain Commons is a neutral not-for-profit um, that has a mission of enabling people to control their own digital destiny. So who am I? I'm Christopher Allen, um, at Christopher Ray on GitHub, on Twitter, almost everywhere. And I'm the principal architect and executive director of Blockchain Commons. So specifically, what is the uh, Gordian community? Um, it is the uh, a, developers that are specifically focused on jointly expanding and using the Gordian specs. Um, again, open, interoperable, secure, compassionate infrastructure is our mission. And this year, we're really focusing on these uh, four uh, initiatives. There are libraries for um, uh, deterministic CBOR and Gordian envelopes, which we are doing uh, a Rust version of, and other people are looking into Kotlin and other kinds of ports. Uh, uh, we are putting together reference examples of various uh, QR, UR crypto requests, such as signing uh, beyond just the typical PSBT signing, which has been a big success for us so far, uh, but also things like account policy creation and some other advanced topics when we start talking about hardware and chips. Uh, this will lead us to be able to do a uh, a lot of our vision around collaborative seed recovery. How can we all be much more reliable and have much better tools, not only to do uh, collaborative and social key recovery, but also be able to evaluate what is good, reliable methods that have no points of uh, failure or of compromise or no more than, you know, uh, no single points at least. Um, and then we really want to create a foundation for collaborative key management. There is certainly a future with multi-sig and musig and frost and all of those that we need to prepare for because it's going to really transform the way we think about uh, security in the next uh, five years. So in our last meeting, uh, we really focused uh, on DC bore and UR interoperability. We introduced DC bore. Uh, again, that's decentralized, uh, excuse me, not decentralized, it's it is deterministic uh, CBOR. And we talked about some of the wallets now supporting URs. And we asked people to start joining some of these community channels, such as Signal and our announcements list, so you can be notified of these meetings. Our topics today are um, these seven. So we're, we want to promote the success of QR, PSBT, Interop. We've got you know, over a dozen companies that uh, are currently uh, uh, doing that, uh, but we'd like to make it better and we'd like to let people more know about the value of being able to do this interoperability. Uh, we went to Dispatch at the ITF. It has some impact on uh, some things if you're interested in international standards, which uh, then relates to some CBOR UR updates that um, we want to make sure everybody are aware of. Uh, because they're changing our uh, internet drafts uh, as we get closer. Um, we've had some success on our legislative work that you might be wanting to know about or participate in next year's uh, vision there. Um, and then we have two uh, presentations from uh, members of the community on uh, new ideas. There's Quick Connect, The Next Generation, and uh, also SSKR for Java cards. So we're hoping that uh, in future meetings, if you have a topic you'd like to uh, talk about that you'll add it to the agenda and let's talk about it. Let's find out, you know, hey, is there other people that are interested in that and how can we make it more interoperable? So um, uh, QR, PSBT, Interop, um, this is our biggest success to date. Again, we have over a dozen wallets. 
Um, so one of the things we wanna do is create a video to celebrate this interoperability. Um, so what we'd really like to try to do is get from each of you a clip of sending and receiving a PSBT from your wallet. So um, uh, Shannon's working on an example of that now for the Gordian Seed tool, but we want, you know, we want it from Sparrow, we want it from, you know, everybody who supports that so that we can just quickly show, hey, here is all of these different wallets that um, interop now for multi-sig uh, PSBTs. So, um, uh, you know, we'll be telling you more details about that, but, you know, let us know if you're interested in contributing uh, that. And, you know, we'll probably need a logo and some other different types of things to put together a really nice video on interoperability success. This does mean you should update your wallet details and entry on the Gordian community page. So uh, we have on the, um, uh, they're wrong. there we go. We have on the uh, Blockchain Commons uh, Gordian community page, this table of what we know about the various uh, uh, projects. So uh, in particular, you note that uh, we have question marks on a few of these. And uh, they're also, not everybody supports all the different uh, URs. If you're supporting one of the other UR formats or are planning to, um, you know, please, you know, add them to this table. Um, but there's also a, uh, a member section here where we talk about, you know, how does somebody contact you? So, you know, if we want, if, uh, you want to reach somebody at Keystone, here's how you can get them at GitHub. If you want somebody at, uh, Foundation Devices, here's Ken. Um, so, uh, if you can update that information. Um, also we have, uh, uh, a number of people who've been doing libraries related to URs, and I don't think we have a listing of all of them current right now. Um, uh, this is what I have right now, which is the uh, uh, BCUR in Java, the UR kit and URUI in Swift, um, uh, Hummingbird, uh, Foundation Devices, Python uh, UR, and then uh, a, uh, a UR Rust uh, version from a third party. So um, uh, if you've got some kind of code, a library, whatever, around any of our uh, uh, you know, crypto commons uh, work, uh, we really want to get to, we want to properly list it here. So, um, and of course, you know, don't forget to subscribe to our uh, community channels. Oop, uh, that's this page. So uh, there's a signal group, which I think most of you are on. Uh, we have a dis GitHub discussions forum here uh, where we do calls for agenda and things of that nature. Uh, it's really easy to just basically go to watch, uh, custom, and then you can bas just basically say you want to only watch the discussions, for instance, um, and that'll make sure you get notified about um, things that are going on at, uh, at Blockchain Commons. Um, so before we go on, any questions regarding PSBT Interop? Is there anybody that would like to talk about, um, about that in their project or other um, uh, Interop successes? Okay. Uh, uh, going forward, um, we uh, presented to, at uh, Dispatch. That's a group that helps us uh, uh, talk about our uh, prospects in ITF. And uh, we talked both about DC Bore and also about Gordian Envelope. And I think the DC Bore stuff, they liked it. They referred us to the C Bore community. And, you know, we've made some good connections there. And I think there's a good chance that there'll be a, uh, a either a profile or maybe even an RFC may eventually come out of the DC Bore work. Um, but I think that we failed in demonstrating the um, uh, simplicity of Gordon, Gordian Envelope as just, you know, I mean, in the end, what it does is it delivers you a deterministic hash. We weren't, we didn't really talk about that. Um, in the end, it's only eight, you know, uh, variants uh, of a leaf of a tree. Um, uh, that did not come across, but probably most important is why, okay? Um, 
you know, we didn't, we sh maybe should have opened with, hey, you guys said in privacy in 6973 and in human rights in 8280 that you need to support these things. And guess what? You're not doing a lot of it. And you're basically still allowing standards to move forward without more privacy. And we think this, because it works with CBOR and works with a variety of other things, offers a lot of opportunity um, for adding privacy to a wide variety of protocols. I mean, they kept on saying, well, you don't have a customer. You don't have a, a client within the IETF that wants to use this. And I'm going, well, to a certain extent, you're all my clients. You know, if you've got data at rest, definitely. And if even if you've got data in transit, you need to start doing privacy. So um, uh, we're talking with people about writing some documents around the guidelines and such. If you're interested in this, you're interested in ITF processes, we'd love to have your help with this. Um, our goal is to have a, a birds of a feather boff uh, at uh, the face-to-face -face in July in San Francisco. Uh, Wolf, do you wanna say anything else about our dispatch experience? Yeah, I'd say that, uh, you know, I went in prepared to make a technical uh, show of, you know, of what envelope is, um, and it became very clear from the feedback we got that we needed to understand, we need to convey better why why envelope is, um, and since then, you know, uh, Christopher's made a lot of notes on that that we'll be incorporating into our future documentation and presentations about that because, you know, uh, I think we, we agree that the, there's a huge case for it. Uh, and of course, you know, having been its primary architect, I'm I'm enamored with its enamored with its simplicity. Um, to a certain extent, I'm not sure that came across properly either, uh, which is something I'll, I'll work on. Um, but uh, um, because you know it is inherently very simple, uh, but um, it's a uh, um, you know it was a learning experience because I I have next to no experience with uh, standards bodies, and so this was this was new. Uh, on the other hand, the kind of feedback we got from people who are, you know, very technically minded, but also the technical, the the standards bodies who are used to working with standard bodies was um, useful. And, um, you know, uh, and uh, I think that I understand the kind of people we're working with. I've worked with many people like that in the past, just not in standards bodies. So I, I, I get I, I get the feedback we got. Thank you. Harrison, um, you know, we didn't mention last time we had presented to the W3C um, and I felt like it, that meeting went a lot better. But do you have any thoughts about, you know, moving forward Gordian Envelope and DC Bore and things of that nature in the W3C or any advice for us based on, you know, our presentation at the W3C? No, I, I think uh, that was a great presentation. I think uh, we probably should continue that discussion because I think uh, the first time we bring it up, uh, I think, you know, it takes my general feedback is like it takes like about three conversations for 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 the full effect to sink in. So, and I think Gordian envelope in general as a data structure is uh, and concept is uh, quite cutting edge. So, uh, so I think we probably should continue to have those discussions uh, to to gain more, uh, I guess, uh, community acceptance and adop uh, adoptance. Yeah. Thank you, Harrison. Anybody else have any comments around IETF and international standardization? Okay, uh, we'll move forward to the next item. So uh, Wolf, I'll let you lead on this. Right. So um, I would be, I've actually um, been on vacation about the past week. I'm still kind of um, getting back into things. But before I left, I spent a very intense week or so um, bringing a lot of our uh, documentation into line with the latest work I've been doing. Uh, I'm pretty certain that pretty much all of our research papers, as well as our uh, uh, IETF internet drafts and so on, are all very consistent right now. By the way, I should mention I'm Wolf McNally. I'm the lead researcher for Blockchain Commons. Uh, and Christopher and I have been working together for a number of years. Uh, I've, you know, uh, the primary kind of lead developer of the UR specification as well as Gordian Envelope, um, and uh, and in this case DCBOR, which we identified as a as you know kind of a necessary foundation for the kinds of things we would like to do with Envelope, and that we think has wide applicability to the the community at large. So um, part of what we need to kind of harmonize in, in this last week is the uh, uh, proposed CBOR tags. Uh, CBOR has a um, like 
if you're thinking about deterministic JSON and so on, they're often, if you want context, they're often using URLs, which are quite uh, lengthy. And you can still use the, those with Seabor as well, but Seabor has its own system of tagging data um, uh, as uh, uh, as having a certain semantics. And then the uh, IANA runs a registry of these tags. Um, so I've been assigning tags as I go uh, from spaces that are fairly low in numbers, but still not occupied by the IANA registry. Uh, and, um, but because I've been kind of adding them as I go, uh, they fall into broad categories. And so it was very kind of ad hoc. Now, some of these tags have already been, uh, are out there in the wild. Uh, and, um, and I've, um, uh, marked those in some of our core documents is now fixed. Um, and they have, those have not been renumbered. In, uh, but meanwhile, the ones that I still consider to be uh, heavily in flux, uh, primarily around Gordian, Gordian envelope and certain things. Uh, I've now kind of stabilized in certain ranges. Uh, you can see there 200 through 206 are th the core envelopes tags. Uh, and some of those were um, things like w w we had one for uh, uh, an encoded cryptographic message um, using um, Chacha Poly. Uh, uh, and um, that now has a fixed number. That's That number has changed, but as far as my knowledge, nobody else was using it at this point. So uh, I, I took liberty to renumber these things. So, um, so two... 100 through 206 are now the core envelope tags. 207 through 212 are for distributed function calls, which we believe will be a major use case for envelopes. Um, and then uh, 300 through 323, many of which are have fixed values in those for things like PSBTs uh, and, and so on, uh, which have not changed, uh, but those are related to Bitcoin uh, and secure components. Um, and then 400 through 410 are used as output descriptor types, which we've documented before. Those haven't changed either. Um, and then 500 is a miscell miscellaneous tag used as a response type for output description response, which again, uh, I don't think anybody else is using currently, but we left it where it was. So they're, they're much more harmonious and that's part of the uh, preparation for actually submitting um, requests for IANA to allocate space in the, in the uh, Seaboard tag namespace. Um, so uh, two previously published names for, uh, as, you, as you know, if you've looked at URs, they are a UR, a UR stands for a uniform uh, a resource. It's a binary encoding uh, in, um, in essentially an ASCII, a limited subset of ASCII that can be used in uppercase for QR codes in, a very, in their very efficient alphanumeric encoding mode. It's generally useful for other things as well because it puts data into a, 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 URR, uh, um, a uh, URI format. Uh, but part of that URI, the, where the scheme would be UR colon is the type. And so we had one called Crypto Digest, which is just for a, a cryptographic digest in this case, uh, SHA-256. We've just changed that to, di to, to digest by itself. So UR colon digest is, is the SHA-256 digest. And crypto message, which is, as I mentioned, is the encrypted message is now just uh, UR colon encrypted. And so these, uh, uh, you know, were the only changes I made to actual registered UR types. Um, if you, in all our specs, we've been consistent. In fact, we've, uh, we've made this a requirement that the, the, the corresponding type and number are together. But if you use the type in a UR, you don't put the Seabor tag on because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between them. And if, you just, if you're going to transmit it as pure binary without, it, without being in UR form, you do put the tag on it. So uh, all the correspondences between these are listed in our documentation. So basically the, the intent being you should be able to move back and forth between UR format and pure Seabor format, uh, and it should round trip. So um, if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me and uh, I'll point you towards the uh, exact right document to answer your questions. Thank you. So um, the, uh, I think at this point, we're fairly certain that this doesn't impact anybody, but there are some people we've experienced in the past who kind of jumped ahead and, and implemented a, you know, kind of a draft proposal and didn't let us know they used it. So we're trying to be uh, clear on that. I mean, I, I know, for instance, that um, uh, Ken is beginning to play around with some of the uh, uh, distributed function calls. Um, I don't think it affects anything at this point, but, uh, you know, let us know if it does uh, before we submit anything to IANA or other places. Um, uh, anybody yeah, have yeah if we're, gonna, if we're gonna make any last minute changes now is the time uh, at least for these tags you know so yeah anybody have any tags that they're you know using that are at risk here or uh challenges i mean obviously we're gonna have to add more um especially as we do more things with the uh, uh w3c community 
uh, we'll probably have to define some more uh, tags in the kind of 300 range around keys that aren't just uh, SEC P256 uh, keys and such. So um, uh, some of these- So I don't, have any, I don't have any feedback, but um, now that you've mentioned all this stuff, I am gonna take a closer look at the, uh, the tag definitions just to see if I do have any, any comments. Yes, please do. And, and also, you know, one of the nice things about tags is, you know, if something is um, a semantically a variant, like let's say digest, because digest, we were using a Blake three digest, and we just recently switched everything over to SHA-256, um, primarily for compatibility with international standards, and whereas Blake three is probably better, but not as well recognized at this point, um, then, um, you know, if we did want to add other digests first, they could still be UR colon digest, but we would have there, uh, we can add additional um, uh, affordances in the seaboard itself to say, yes, it's, it's digest, but it's not, it's, it's a different kind of digest. For example, we wanted to add Blake three later. Didn't recognize that as a digest because they wouldn't recognize it as a Blake three digest, but digests that were Blake three would just be recognized as, as digest. They would be able to handle uh, SHA-256 or Blake three uh, equally well, just by recognizing the form uh, of the seaboard that goes with the, the type of digest. So we don't need to add um, new UR types or top level tags for every possible, you know, variation semantic that can happen at a lower, at a lower level and in internal level. Thank you very much. Um, any last comments on, on this? Uh, a lot of exciting stuff is going to be coming this year. I'm really looking forward to uh, some of the distributed function call capabilities, because um, among other things, they can go multiple direct, you know, multiple levels deep. So, you know, the 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 coordinator uh, out in the cloud can make a request of your local iPhone app. Your local iPhone app can now make a request. Um, uh, related to that to a secure biometric device, uh, which in turn uh, may uh, actually use a UR to the chip. If it's like a cramium chip, uh, which Crossbar is proposing, uh, it will actually allow for some very simple UR uh, commands so that it can respond at the chip and do the operation, the signing, and then pass it all the way back to the coordinator when it's needed. So we really want to be able to have you know, a variety of different kinds of advanced flexibility uh, where we don't really care that, you know, hey, you know, it's a UR from the server through a QR code, but from the iPhone to the biometric device, it's a NFC from the, the, the biometric device to the silicon is, you know, some kind of trusted secure channel, um, you know, on the board. Uh, we want to handle that that very broad range of things, and I think that's something that nobody else is really trying to to think about that range of things. So, moving on, um, Walt, you want to continue on this? Uh, sure. So, um, if uh, some of you here have no doubt read the uh, internet draft for Guardian Envelope or looked at the um, uh, looked at the the, uh, uh, reference implementation in Swift. Um, I am I've officially broken ground on the reference implementation uh, we're doing for Rust. Uh, as you know, we already have uh, a, uh, a DC bore um, internet draft as well, and uh, uh, and we have the reference implementation in both Rust and Swift. Uh, and they're they've been aligned to be very close to each other in terms of their the semantics and the, and the capabilities of their APIs, but they're idiomatic within their languages. So. Uh, the feature that I've added to Envelope is because it occurred to me that one of the um, basic use cases of Envelopes, especially when you're dealing with large data, is to have some kind of um, uh, ability for Envelopes to become compressed. And uh, in this case, where uh, it made sense to implement that as a uh, as an eighth uh, Envelope case, which is a nice round number of eight now. Um, but and then we've chosen to use the, uh, the the deflate algorithm as our default choice because it's generally um, you know quite useful and highly available and even standardized. So uh, obviously uh, there could be other forms of compression used that could be adopted over time again without having to add another case because those are all the compressed case. And like the encrypted and lighted cases, it is uh, the third case that uh, declares its digest of what it should be, what, uh, what the actual envelope inside it should be when it is uncompressed and, and expanded to become an envelope. So 
Um, it doesn't really change the semantics of what envelopes are in general. It's all envelopes within envelopes within envelopes. Uh, there's now three cases, encrypted, alighted, and compressed, that declare a digest. Alighted has no additional data with it. Encrypted has an encrypted payload, and compressed has a compressed payload. And they, when, if you replace them with their unencrypted, unalighted, or uncompressed counterparts, it, it's the exact same envelope, essentially. So sem semantically, it's the same envelope. It's just been gone, gone through these three kinds of transformations, which are collectively I call the obscured uh, the obscured cases. So because the contents are obscured in some way, they're by being by omitted in the Elida case or by being encrypted or by being compressed. Um, so, um, and so uh, you can see that that's our, our, uh, our internet draft, which we haven't actually published the full internet draft yet. Uh, it's still in the editor's uh, copy. Um, so that's, uh, we were waiting for the window to open up the window to, to support, uh, to, um, submit new versions of the ID to IT ETF closed just before the big meeting. And then, so we didn't make it in the, by that deadline. When that window opens up, um, I will submit the new draft, but right now you can check out our, uh, our editor's draft, which has those changes. Um, and then conversations, as you heard Christopher say, we were at the dispatch meeting and that's basically, you know, where, okay, you want to approach the, I, the IET to work with us. Uh, we need to dispatch. And so, um, as expected, the, the, the CBOR working group, who, which we are been having some fruitful conversations with, um, one thing we discussed with them is that one of the specs I, uh, requirements I had made is that uh, map entries be not be null, because that seemed to, to me to be indistinguishable from the case of the map, not having the map entry at all. And the idea is to have the DC board describe what you need to do to make it deterministic. Um, after further consideration and, and kind of concerns raised by the group, I realized that, no, there are, is a semantic difference between them. I won't get into that right now, but uh, that's the only um, semantic change that we've made to the DC bore internet draft and also the uh, reference implementations have been updated to allow uh, null map entries at this point. So, um, and uh, that's, uh, that's the main thing. And, all, all, and of course, you know, all of these all of our reference implementations have been have been brought into line with these internet draft updates. Thank you. Um, does anybody have any questions about the internet drafts or about some of these changes? I mean, at this point, we did not have a specific uh, uh, developer community member say that, you know, hey, this uh, compressed case is really important to us, uh, but um, uh, we felt like it made sense, and I, I suspect that there um, might be some people that might that can use it. Um, yeah, in many cases, payloads, you know, obviously, um, if your payload is small, you get no benefit. In fact, you add a little overhead. But if your payload is like, you know, even 100 bytes, it can probably be made a little bit. In cases where that's what matters and you have the ability to decompress it on the other end, um, you know, I, I think having a general built-in facility for that could be quite useful. This was not a demand-driven thing. In fact, that's one of the criticisms we got at the day is, you know, uh, well, why does this exist and, and who would the customer inside IETF be for this? Apparently, this is something, you know, that's new to me. You get a lot more um, uh, respect from the IETF if you're already saying, hey, we're solving this customer demand. Well, we are with Gordian Envelope, but we just didn't have the way of articulating that at that point. So um, in many ways, I'm doing something I think would be good. Nobody is required who is doing like uh, their own implementation of of uh, Gordian uh, envelope needs to support compression. It's you know it, it, look these things. There's a there's a semantic space for it. There's a case for it. But if you don't need it and you need like a very size limited version, you don't want to include a deflate algorithm, or whatever. You don't have to implement it. There's nothing about it that says you have to implement it. If you want to create a full reference implementation, yeah, you should support it. But uh, because it's part of the actual, it's actually one of the eight cases. But you know, for actual practical deployment purposes in small environments, you don't need it. I wonder if it makes sense to sort of do a variant for PSBT signing because, like, you know, one of the things we're running into is like larger PSBTs are really annoying to sign over QR because it takes so long to scan them. Yep. Uh, and like, if we right. could compress them down quite a bit, that could make it possible to scan a large or to sign a larger PSBT in a shorter time. Right. So the UR PSBT, you know, the actual PSBT type of UR is just a, a PSBT. But if you yeah. put it into a Gordian envelope and then compress that envelope and send that envelope as a compressed envelope and the receiver knows they could be getting a compressed envelope that contains a PSBT, then sure, then the transmission and reception of Gordian envelope 
uh, means that if you get a compressed arm, you know what it is, you know how to decompress it, you know uh, that it's yeah. you know it's sending a PSPT signing request, like, and, and it, it can be even be wrapped in the in the semantics of a of a remote uh, function call. So yeah, I mean that's one answer. Yeah, I wonder, would say. Go ahead, Ken. I, I was just gonna say like I wonder like does it make sense to define this as a an extension like a standard extension then, um, so that we don't all do it differently. Well, uh, it, it it has to be if you're gonna implement it in this case, it has to be deflate right now. If you're gonna go by our internet draft. Um, and, you know, when we have, you know, uh, the reference implementations as well as, you know, uh, I'm not sure any specific test vectors, but the reference implementations definitely have test cases in them that show whether you've gotten it right or not. So there's only one way to support it right now. Um, and um, uh, so it's not a matter of you can just use any old compression algorithm or whatever. We we state very specifically what the parameterization has to right. be. So to, like, for it to so be like right. So like you're going to, me as a developer, I'm going to define some seaboard to, to wrap this uh, PSBT, right? Um, you know, then mm -hmm. then compress it. So, like, whatever it is that whatever that seaboard looks like, you know, we should we should standardize that. Yeah, we um, can get examples for that. I don't think that's the problem. I, I do have a kind of a larger question. I think that's the pragmatic answer, given the you know the dozen or so wallets that are out there, and you know, some of them have never shown up at, at any of these meetings. I do believe that the right answer is to actually encode. Uh, PSBTs in a more generic form that is binary centric. I mean, it, right now, a lot of the problems, like we, we literally ran in today, Shannon and I were trying to make a little video of Sparrow and Seed Tool exchanging a PSBT. But Sparrow has kind of moved on to multi-path descriptors, which is not a BIP yet. And, you know, it's kind of got some weird things because it kind of implies a change policy in there and whatever. And this whole binding of, oh, well, you know, an X pub means this and a Y pub means this policy. And then, oh, well, that kind of ended up being a never, you know, a never ending mess. But we're going to keep X pubs, even if we're not going to do Y pubs and all that kind of stuff anymore. This, by you know, binding the encoding and the and the data and the policies all into this weird object that um, uh, that is tightly tied. Uh, you know, this is exactly what Seaboard, you know, uh, is designed to make easy. You have a self-describing thing. This is uh, an extended public key. Uh, you know, this is a, uh, a BIP32 path. Uh, this is the some policy hints. You know, you want SegWit or you want Taproot. Uh, here's... Uh, you know, the, the, are, the are you suggesting are... a completely new format in, in, instead of PSPT so, or just defining no, Seaboard so, that maps to PSPT? Let me finish on that. So I, I think that would be the ideal from the long term because then we could do things that are beyond just Bitcoin, you know, other kinds of, you know, pre-signed transaction type things. Uh, 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 you know, partially signed transaction type things could be generalized for all of our use cases. That being said, um, unless we had some critical mass of developers uh, that wanted to support, um, uh, you know, going to that level of, you know, break, you know, you know, breaking this apart uh, <clears throat> is right now going to be challenging. So, I mean, if, you know, if you and Sparrow and two or three other wallet companies said, yeah, Let's you know just bite the bullet and just describe this in a in a in a well thought out, well layered way, uh, and we'll at least be compatible with each other, and we'll you know try to be compatible with the people who aren't at the table. Um, then I might reconsider it. But right now, I'd say the short term solution is you know if you've got a a, a 10k descriptor with you know a you know a uh, not a 10k descriptor a 10k uh, PSBT. Um, it's got all these transaction headers and you know and all these this change that's being consolidated, et cetera. Uh, you know, just compress it. <laughs> you know, it's the short term yeah. pragmatic answer. <laughs> the the reason why we well, you know, you are PSPT, I just define it as it is. It just has, you know, it's it's uh, it's header and then and then the actual current binary PSPT was for expediency. You know, if it were up to me at this point, especially having Gordian envelope, I would basically say. You know the Bitcoin transaction to be signed as the subject. The, the signatures uh, are the are the assertions on the subject, uh, yeah. and I would encode it as an envelope. Um, but even then, you know, compression can be used. And the nice thing about the adding compression to the envelope is, um, 
uh, because it doesn't change the Merkle tree of the envelope to compress an arm of it, if you have a particular bigger arm, yes, the, the receiver does have to recognize, oh, this arm might be compressed because it might be big and just check for that and then say, oh yeah, uncompress it. It's the same envelope. So you could send it compressed or uncompressed and have the exact same semantics. You just need to make sure the receiver checks to that. Oh yeah, if this is compressed, uncompress it. Don't just reject it. Um, because, you know, once it's uncompressed, it's put in place. It's just another you know, it's just it's just a PSBT uh, ready for signing, and so you can make that part as a PSBT signing request envelope. That's a that's a using the request response uh, uh, semantics. So, um, in my opinion, everything should get easier, including you know making uh, PSBTs, which I think are fairly compressible. Uh, you know, um, smaller. Yeah, and I feel like this general problem. If we think about you know the pattern of what is a PSBT, which is a partially signed transaction. Okay, um, there are lots of other things we want to do partial signings for. Um, you know that was one of the headaches in the uh, when we had that uh, special meeting on uh, you know how do we do UR QR signing of other other things is that. Okay, you know, if we try to in, you know inherit the legacy Bitcoin transaction format, then we end up having ten weird special use cases for this is oh this is what a PGP signature looks like this is what a whatever, um, and again those bindings are all kind of uh, uh, you know messy. If we can abstract that out, then we have something that generically will allow us to do partial signatures for a lot more things and allow, you know, the UXs to go, oh, wait a second, you know, I don't understand this path that you've given me. This is not a not, you know, a standard path. And then be able to warn the user, oh, you know, this is not a path I recognize as being conventional. And and you know, do you still really want to do it? Um, which is kind of hard to do right now with um uh, you know, you really have to, you know, uh uh, you know, follow not just the BIPs, but because, I mean, like I said, multi-path descriptors, which might be, you know, used in a PSBT isn't even uh, uh, a BIP yet. And there are other PSBT, you know, emerging problems as we're trying to do more complex uh, things that I think could have been generalized better. Don't know. It's going to be a, a question for uh, this community. Um, you know, uh, and, you know, the, uh, you know, Sparrow, who's on another time, we need to, we need to start having fun meetings on in the mornings for the European developers. So um, we're going to be puzzling out how to alternate that. But um, uh, so in any case, if you, if they ask for a customer who wants this, you can say, I want it for PSBT signing. <laughs> Right. So right. Well, we have one uh, thumbs up. And, cool. <laughs> and before we leave the topic, I, I want to point out that if you go through all the examples of the envelope documentation I've given, where I talk about, well, here's a generic hello world message, and here's how Alice and Bob would sign it, and here's how you have a threshold, you know, uh, a number of signatures to check for that, and how my reference implementation will already check for a certain threshold number of signatures. Um, you know, uh, I'm I'm trying to lay down kind of um, use patterns for how you might do such things because it doesn't have to be hello world. It could be uh, a Bitcoin transaction. It doesn't have to be, you know, Alice and Bob. It could be anything signing these things using any methodology. Um, the same, you know, basic patterns could apply. So I'm trying to develop um, a, a pattern language for envelopes. And obviously the community, you know, I would love it for the community to help with that uh, and look at what I've done and say, oh yeah, this is or isn't applicable to these kinds of other things we'd like to do with it. So thank you, um, and moving forward to our next agenda item. So um, this isn't precisely technical, but I wanted to make sure you knew about it. So Blockchain Commons has been very involved in uh, Wyoming, um, and uh, you know not just Wyoming, but also in Europe and Argentina and other places around uh, creating a, a stronger legal basis around uh, safe practices for uh, keys and uh, one of our biggest successes is this Wyoming bill um, that uh, uh, passed and is signed by the governor and starts this June, which basically it does two things. Uh, first off, in if if you're a Wyoming court, which means it you know it won't work in all the world or the United States yet, but at least it's a precedent. A court cannot demand a a, a judge cannot demand a pretrial attorney cannot demand in a court proceeding your private keys. They may uh, be able to ask you 
for a public key to so you know so that your wife can have a fair distribution of assets and things of that nature. And if you don't give them a public key, uh, you know there are actions that they can take, but they can't take your private keys. Uh, uh, because there's just, first off, there's no secure way to do so. So that's a fundamental problem. Um, and then at a certain point, there are just lots and lots of risks. We had uh, federal prosecutors testify that, you know, federal prosecutors should not have this data because uh, they don't have the capability for it. We had some judges go, oh my God, I don't want to have this in my in my uh, offices <laughs> uh, type of thing. So uh, that law passed. And then uh, obviously, uh, you know, there's a lot of things around legal clarity uh, around digital assets and Wyoming has uh, some, some nice tools uh, from a legislation side. And even if you're not a Wyoming citizen starting, I think uh, December, it might be January, uh, you'll be able to register digital assets under Wyoming law. So sort of in the same way when you have a contract that says, hey, if there are any disputes in regards to this contract, you know, we will, we will, you know, do, we will handle those disputes in a particular court. This is sort of a way of saying, hey, if there's any disputes about this digital asset or this digital identity or whatever, um, we will use the terms and language and, and whatever of the chancery courts of Wyoming who have special knowledge. So I felt that was an interesting success that you guys might want to you know, know about. Any comments from anybody? Okay, so moving on from there, um, I haven't seen um, Peter. Peter wanted to present on this topic, and uh, and I also had a a, a, a ping from um, on our other update, which was the Java card that he was running late. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of it, and then we can go on to a general discussion. So uh, what is Quick Connect? Um, so Quick Connect is uh, a QR code that allowed for a, um, uh, a server, in particular, the little node servers, um, but we also use it in, um, in uh, the, I, the Apple uh, Mac um, uh, server installer called Gordian Server, where, you know, how do, now that I've got this and I've got this up on the net, how do I communicate with it in order for a mobile app or a remote app to be able to do so? So we created Quick Connect uh, that allowed you to either, you know, get you get a little QR code from a sticker on the bottom of the box or a little QR code on a display or on a web page when you connected to it that would then allow these remote devices to communicate with that full node over Tor. I mean, it was largely, they're all, uh, as you can see here, uh, it's largely just a uh, an onion address. So, um, uh, and it, you know, also uh, supports Tor's ability to do some other, um, you know, capabilities and do so securely. So, um, uh, there are probably over 30 little, you know, projects and or hardware companies uh, that have little, uh, you know, Bitcoin full nodes uh, that use this. And I think a couple of other uh, people do that. But all it does is allow you to communicate with your full node over, uh, over Tor. But there's a lot of things emerging here. So the you know, we, if we're talking about Nostr now, you know, we're wanting to talk to some node that is going to handle your um, your lightning services, uh, not just your uh, your uh, your uh, um, uh, your full node uh, transaction uh, confirmation. Uh, so, you know, he wanted to present about this. He has some proposals. Um, I'll post these links up um, in uh, the in uh, GitHub in our discussion area. But I think it also raises a larger problem of service discovery. Like, you know, how does Ken's device um, offer, you know, some special service to some app that's out there that, you know, is unique to Ken's device that's beyond just, you know, signing Bitcoin transactions? Um, you know, maybe Ken's device can store something securely or it can, you know, store a share, a uh, social secret share. Uh, for somebody, how do we advertise these services? 
And then also how do we advertise them when some of them may be, you know, other secure methodologies uh, such as a Tor Onion or some kind of, of um, Diffie-Hellman secured NFC with, uh, you know, a, a trust on first use, et cetera. So I thought that was a, you know, a, an interesting uh, topic to have for, for broader discussion. Um, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on uh, Ken again. Do you have any kind of thoughts on, you know, the, this discovery problem and, you know, is this something that blockchain commons should uh, begin to tackle? Um, so, I mean, when we spoke yesterday, we were talking a little bit about the case where uh, we're going to start doing encrypted communication uh, between Envoy and Passport. And so, like, there's a sort of that whole Diffie-Hellman key exchange trust on first use type stuff there. And so I don't know if this is appropriate for that. Maybe we can talk about that at some point. Um, but as of right now, we haven't got any plans to sort of advertise any services, sort of the way you mentioned, but uh, not out of the realm of possibility. I mean, one of the other on our next device. Yeah, you know, one of the other services we do now that I wanted to add to Quick Connect was Spotbit. So pricing service, like how do you communicate securely to some exchange to go, what is the current you know, US price uh, uh, for Bitcoin and do so from a, a uh, um, and, you know, from a cafe in Iran <laughs> or Korea, <laughs> I don't know, uh, how do you do so in a secure way? Um, and uh, that would be another example of a, of a kind of service that a wallet, you know, uh, you know, your little iPhone uh, supplement uh, or a transaction coordinator um, or other thing might need to know that information. And right now, you know, it's, you know, having to talk securely to say, if you've got a, 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 uh, um, a uh, you know, a traditional wallet, um, uh, you know, you're going to basically be talking to their headquarters, wherever it is in France or in Prague, and, and uh, uh, basically asking, you know, their server to then ask somebody for the current price. Uh, that feels very not decentralized to me. So, it's it's a it's a it's a larger problem. I'm hoping we can uh, tackle it this year. But like everything we do, we really want to do things when we have at least two parties that are you know really seriously interested in in uh, making it possible. So we'll, we'll keep this on the agenda. Maybe he'll present um, um, uh, in a future Gordian meeting. Um, I don't see well we'll hang around a little bit longer. The, the, the essence here is that, uh, you know, all of our code for SSKR is in uh, C. Um, we, uh, and he's basically translated it into uh, uh, Java, the very limited version of Java that is called, that Java card uses. And, uh, you know, ended up coming up with some interesting uh, different approaches to generating all the values, but he basically can, um, in a very constrained device with very constrained memory, uh, be able to do, um, uh, you know, all of the SSKR operations. And I think this is significant because this may mean that we can do things like, you know, NFC cards and other low power devices or whatever that can cooperate in uh, various kinds of SSKR related functions. And remember with envelope, we have the ability to have SSKR permits for envelopes. So, you know, you could have a device that, you know, gets the the uh, you know the data from one device and then uses the SSKR permit from a, from a you know NFC card and an NFC uh, you know uh, a biometric ring from somebody else and then be able to restore the envelope uh, you know decrypt the envelope so um, I think there's some interesting things there uh, and you know I think uh, Ken to your you know, question regarding the, you know, trust on your first use. He also wants to puzzle out, you know, how do we make NFC more secure with some kind of trust and first use? So he he concurs with your, um, you know, thing that we we need to come up with some good answers here. Um, okay, well, um, 
uh, we'll have an opportunity for a little bit of discussion just in case um, one of our two uh, presenters uh, can show up. Our next uh, monthly call uh, will not be at the at the 4 p.m. time. Um, instead, we're going to hold it in conjunction with Silicon Salon 4. Um, not all of the events will do this, but um, but we felt like this there was some real synergy here. Um, in particular, Andrew Polstra is going to be uh, talking about um, preventing key exfiltration through signature non-stata. And I feel like this is something at all, any wallet who is doing signing at some level. I mean, if you're if you've got MicroPython code or you know, Rust code that is, you know, executing on some uh, processor somewhere, uh, you ought to support uh, you know, this uh extra this particular approach to prevent uh, a corrupt device from sending through the nonces parts of your private keys. Um, it's a fairly simple protocol. Um, it would mean, for instance, when we're, you know, kind of deconstructing things like PSVTs, uh, that, you know, there ought to be an option for, oh, here is the, uh, the key exfiltration nonce um, data that you need, some, some random data that the device signing needs. And then when the device signing returns, it's not just returning the sign, the signature, it's also returning a little proof that said, yes, I did incorporate your randomness, and you can prove that I that this truly is a random number uh, that has been returned. So I think that's an important uh, uh, for anybody who's doing signing. Um, uh, we have some other discussions around, um, you know, chip uh, stuff. This is very much what Silicon Salon is all about is kind of how do we connect uh, the the wallet developers and the chip makers and the software and the cryptographers all together. Um, uh, Luke Layton and David Calderwood is going to be talking about how we can make that faster uh, through uh, some interesting big integer stuff on the chip. And then in general, we want to have an open hardware discussion. Um, you know, a number of companies uh, are constrained by other companies' uh, trade secrets and NDAs and whatever to make uh, open hardware truly open. But there are things we can do. So we're trying to, to nail down what the... Um, what, what does that really mean to have to be truly open and be able to say that your hardware is open, whether or not it's chips or the 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 uh, the the micro um, the I forgot what they what they're called, but the where you put multiple chips on a single substrate, uh, the pack those packages, whether or not those packages now are on a on a board and that board is now integrated into a larger system. Uh, you know the 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 way we talk about open software today, doesn't quite map completely. There are issues in there. So how can we do better? And what does that mean? What does open hardware mean? So those those are at least three of the topics. It's another full month away. We may have a couple of other uh, presentations. And if you know any of you are experts on uh, kind of this you know this question or have some opinions about open hardware, um, uh, we'd love to have you uh, you know come to the meeting and maybe even present some of your ideas. I mean. The, you know, the salons aren't just about these presentations. They're also about really good questions. So um, I hope uh, that you can make it next month. And then, uh, uh, you know, the first uh, Wednesday in June will be the, you know, we'll continue the conversation on Gordian um, uh, developer call. Uh, and then we always, part of the thing we did, we used to have these meetings bi-weekly. Um, and that was a little bit too much, uh, but you know we will have occasions where you know three, four, five people just want together get together to talk about a specific problem. Uh, we had a, an example of that with the signing call. So um, if there's a particular topic you'd really like to you know to to cover uh, before our re next regular meeting, you know we can basically announce, oh, we're doing a special call on this topic, you know, at this time that makes sense for you know, the core uh, parties of that group and let everybody know and and pull that together and we will do uh, the, the transcripts and uh, YouTube videos and all that kind of stuff to, uh, uh, you know, for people who can't attend. Um, so um, let's just, you know, oh, I should say, as always, we hope that you will uh, financially support us on GitHub. Uh, you know, all of this work is sponsored uh, by uh, the community. 
And we greatly appreciate everybody's help. A number of you here today are um, you know, ongoing sustaining sponsors for uh, Blockchain Commons. So thank you very much. Um, uh, we'll close this. Uh, record, let's see, close this. Stop share. There it is. Okay, so um, we uh, we don't have to go to the full five thirty call. Does anybody have? We have a few people that haven't um, uh, been at previous meetings. Uh, Javier, uh, Irfan, Jim, do you want to? Do you have anything you want to share or any topics that you'd like to see us? You have a question mm -hmm. over in chat, Chris. Oh, sorry. Will there be a QR demo of legacy Bitcoin signing with Envelope? Yes. So that is something we definitely want to support. Um, we we uh, did a, uh, a YouTube video of our special signing meeting. Um, and that was definitely something that uh, came up. But I think we also want to do um, uh, some, you know, I think we need to be able to handle some of these legacy problems, but also be, potentially be able to do it in a better way. So there's a lot of times where uh, a party wants to know, you know, do you have control over this particular address? Um, or is this wallet the wallet I think it is? And can it prove that it, um, you know, has the, the uh, key material that, you know, uh, that I thought it had? Um, so there are a variety of different kinds of interesting authentication, authorization, um, uh, and, uh, you know, what is it authenticating and whatever. We'd like to do that a little bit better. And I think we can, you know, learn from that while still offering some support for things like, you know, a legacy Bitcoin address, um, legacy Bitcoin signing from, uh, you know, Bitcoin five or four or whatever it was that was the first one to do that. Um, yeah, he's giving a thumbs up. Cool. Okay. Uh, Jim, any, um, uh, I think for whatever day, for whatever reason today was a slow day, um, but you, any particular things you would like to see Blockchain Commons doing or any questions about what we're doing? Well, I mean, you know, you and I had a conversation DM over Twitter. Um, I wouldn't presume to know enough about what Blockchain Commons goals and prior work has been to really comment on that. Uh, I will say um, for those who are interested maybe in preparing themselves for Andrew's talk about anti-exfiltration uh, measures. Um, there is actual code available. Uh, it is part of the implementation of Blockstream's Jade hardware wallet. So it's already integrated into that code base. Um, and the Blockstream Jade is, um, I won't say unique, but, but remarkable. Um, in that all of the firmware is, uh, you know, as well as the, the um, um, driving software is all open source. The primary interface to using the Blockstream hardware wallet, uh, rather than have a separate piece of driver code, you know, like Ledger Live or the Trezor Suite or anything like that, um, you use the Blockstream desktop um, code as the, the default interface to talk to and control your wallet. So you can find the anti-exfiltration code somewhere in there. Right. Um, don't have to have it handy. Uh, so I can't just like point to it in the chat, but if you dig around a little bit, mm -hmm. there was certainly a blog entry on the topic on Blockstream's site. Andrew of course works for Blockstream. He's the, the lead of their research team. Um, so that's one thing. Um, one thing I'm working on that's, you know, trivial in terms of coding, although, you know, with any kind of crypto, you know, even trivial is still fraught with lots and lots of, of foot gun traps, um, is the, uh, again, this refers to a feature of um, Blockstream Jade, relatively new feature they added, which allows you to create a sub key conforming to the BIP85 um, 
um, standard or specification. So what this allows you to do is derive a key from the same seed or a new seed um, from the, the seed that your hardware wallet is protecting. And then you can use this, which is presented to you as a mnemonic, 12 or 24 word mnemonic, which you can then turn around and use to, for instance, initialize a software wallet. One example is uh, I used one of my Jade devices to derive the seed that I'm using on the test flight version of the Mobile Green app so that I don't have to maintain yet another seed recovery mnemonic. I can just go ahead and, and re-derive it if I should ever need to. Right. Um, part of the thing that, you know, this is an example of why we want to try to, you know, puzzle out and abstract things like, you know, what is a Seaboard description of a path is that you know there's a lot of weird stuff that happens in BIP 85 because there is not you know um, uh, you know it's a it's a, a weird triviality but you know there is you cannot take a Bitcoin uh, master uh, extended key and make BIP 32 words out of it. It's a one way transition from the you know the the seed randomness uh, to the master Bitcoin key. So. Um, uh, that was, you know, a weird thing um, that, that uh, you know, happened early on in Bitcoin. And as a consequence, you know, turning any of the other extended keys into this back into the seeds, uh, it, you know, you, you, there's some games that have to be played and that's what ends up defining it in uh, BIP uh, 85. Um, Actually, though, we want to support what, BIP 85, but I think uh, we're also, we want to basically puzzle out the pattern and the problem and go, Oh, there are you know there are other you know uses for that other than just the the specific thing that um, that BIP eighty five does. Actually, if I could, first of all, XPubs and the various forms ZPub, YPub, et cetera. The primary complication there isn't so much the derivation of the public half of those keys, but rather with more complex setups, you have descriptors and you have a lot more use of multi-sig, well, there is no such thing as a single XPUB for a multi-sig wallet, for example. Right. So, but but that's entirely different in my view than what it, um, BIP85 is talking about. So in addition to the ability to control multiple sub wallets, such as your mobile and desktop wallets from your hardware device, what I'm interested in much more specifically, and what we discussed is derivation of other types of usually 256 bit seeds, such as uh, the Noster public private key pairs, uh, your wire guard keys, your exactly. um, the ability to initialize a pair or multiple instances of a UB key such that they are effectively clones of one another in much the same way as hardware wallets are clones of one another. Right. There are use cases where being able to take this sub key that you have derived and that you can re-derive from your one, if you will, your, your hard point um, in terms of secure keys, being able to re-derive the various other things, for instance, on a per device basis. So I'll have one of these that I derive for a new laptop. And then because it's exposed to the laptop, all of the different private keys that I generate for the various different applications on that, that use keys, I don't have to worry about them being involved in my backup and thus having to secure them in my backups. In fact, I want to exclude them from my backups because I can always re-derive them. Right. And so the results in a much more secure, you know, much better OPSEC all the way around. Yep. So and like I said, exactly what, the so code for this is fairly trivial. For instance, for Noster, you use the uh, pip install of bip39, right? And that can then derive, you know, um, decode the mnemonic into its core. And also it can do the derivation to add in additional phrases. So for instance, for Noster, I might have um, one BIP85 key and I generate multiple separate Noster key pairs from it 
to have segregation between, for instance, my private um, chat, you know, and activity versus my more professional things. So anyway, that's what I'm interested in. I don't expect it to be technically all that um, sophisticated in terms of code, but rather um, thinking through, and I I am, by the way, an ops guy operation. (laughs) Um, And so thinking through the implications of how to use these things once you have them is much more what I'm interested in. So you, you should definitely take a look at the, the, the collaborative seed recovery stuff that we've been working on, and we hope to have some good multiple wallet demos this summer. So, I mean, first off, there is the ability to do some fairly sophisticated things because of the envelope package. So one of the things the envelope package means is that, you know, we can give you, we can have the, the key, the extended information, which is not precisely a key, but it's something else. Um, we can have the, the various path and policy information, descriptors, et cetera, all in an object uh, that can be backed up um, in a very reliable way, even if you don't necessarily know what all those different pieces are. For instance, you know, a lot of wallets these days store the date the key was created so that it doesn't have to, you know, you know, go all the way back to the beginning of history to, to do things. To get the to get the data, but not all wallets, you know, want that or need that. So there's a lot of optional data there, and then you have the ability. We have this package encryption capability. So obviously, you can encrypt it with a symmetric secret, but you can also encrypt it with a public key, such that you know maybe only one of your other public keys can can recover it. But more importantly, it's the you have the ability to actually divide that into shares. So you could have those shares be on, you know, uh, a variety of different places that are secure for you. Um, and you, uh, even that data uh, will not just the keys, but the data will not be lost uh, if you get uh, adequate shares for that. And because envelopes have this ability to do elision, you don't necessarily have to put all the information in all those shares. So for instance, the the information that is necessary for your um you know your heirs to be able to to recover a uh, uh, you know their inheritance in Bitcoin um, doesn't necessarily um, you know have to include the data that is about you know how do I connect to Signal and you know how do you get my Signal history and all that kind of stuff. But those can can actually be intertwined so that you know that you can recover. Uh, the the you can divide up your shares in a fashion that is appropriate for their potential future use. Um, and then I'll say there are also a lot of weird problems because Signal, for instance, um, uh, doesn't use SecP, um, and there are some very specific problems with two five five one nine which it does use. So they cannot do HD keys um, in the in a safe fashion. Uh, like uh, Bitcoin does, they can do some derivations. Um, they can do any hardened derivation, but you can't do any of the uh, unhardened derivations safely. Um, and there are problems with other, you know, systems, uh, SSH in this fashion, uh, et cetera. So, you know, in all of our designs, I'm trying to think, okay, so how do we do this in a fashion so it'll work for Bitcoin? Which I think, you know, has a, a better uh, security uh, properties in in uh, in uh, in SecP, but still be able to allow us to secure things like Tor, um, uh, uh, Signal, et cetera. I mean, I, I mean, Tor is yet another one. It's like they have this one-way transform that happens in there. So we had to go through a bunch of testing different apps and whatever to discover, oh, there is a universal donor seed that that is possible to create a public and private key for that can then be made children of on both the public side and on the private key side that will work with Tor. Because if you just back up the Tor keys, um, you know, there is not an equivalent of BIP85 that allows you to reverse that. (laughs) Well, Uh, um, I think somebody listening to what you're saying might be confused because you you talk about um, backing a, a mnemonic out of a seed, and that's not at all what BIP85 is, is about. No, it's I know that. I, I know what that is. I mean, it's creating a whole new seed based on a derivation of the original seed. 
Um, exactly. It does, and it does two Shaw 256s and all that kind of stuff. And, sure, and whatever. Sure. So, so I understand I think, that, but you can't I think prove I've into the weeds. My point was I'm looking to simplify the lives of mere mortal ops guys so that they can have one hard point and a document that does not have to be maintained secret. One secret plus something that they perhaps encrypt using that secret, but then um, almost every other application, as many as possible, can then be extracted from that seed into the full forest yep. of the things that they need to support. So for instance, I don't care if I can derive anything hierarchically deterministic out of my signal key. What I want is the ability to tell signal, use this as the basis for your, your key. Right. And so, if I can do that, then so, all the other use cases I can work through in an administrative fashion from those two constituent pieces. Well, I do really want to, I mean, A, I want to serve regular users. So, you know, we've done, we've had SSKR out for a while, but, it, you know, one of the things that was missing was you couldn't put in the policy and the descriptors and all this other data. So we've solved that. That'll be coming out this sub summer with Gordian Companion that at least three or four wallets will be supporting. But, you know, there are in other interesting problems. So for instance, you may, especially like with Noster, um, you may at some point want to be able to, to prove that your new Noster key is related to your old Noster key after the fact. Okay, so it's like um, I'm using a Noster key at some point, maybe prudently, I'm rotating it after a year or whatever, and I've now got a new one. Um, and, you know, you may need to prove to a third party in a safe way that, oh, this new one actually is, um, uh, you know, associated and, you know, and so there's some interesting ZK proof alternatives. There's also, you know, other ways of doing derivations or whatever. We don't need to go into that, but, you know, we, we know how to do some of these things cryptographically, but we don't know how to, you know, we haven't made it easy for people, you know, at your level, at the ops level, much less regular users. And uh, I think things like the crypto request stuff will help uh, the uh, developers create better tools to be able to go, oh, I need this type of thing from you. Please generate this proof or generate this sub key or whatever. So there's that kind of developer level. I think there's this ops level where we have, you know, um, uh, things like the command line utilities, et cetera, that will be able to do all of these different kinds of things for you, you know, at an ops level. And then, of course, user level, where we really want to make this as easy and as painless as possible, um, and yet still, you know, help people avoid foot guns like single points of failure and, and single points of compromise. Um, I hope you've seen our multi-sig scenario. That was what we did with Sparrow, um, and uh, foundation devices and seed tool for a multi-sig um, with no single points of failure. You know, the, 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 the Sparrow can fail, the, uh, the, um, uh, the foundation devices can fail, the offsite off can fail, and the uh, seed tool can fail. Um, so, uh, and, you know, all of those, if any single one of those is compromised, you know, you, you still don't lose things. And there's a subtle distinction between compromise and, and uh, failure. So we did a really good job on that. And we wrote that all up, but it turns out nobody wants to do it because it's still too hard. I mean, yeah, it's 20 minutes rather than, you know, the day long thing that, you know, Glacier and some of the other multi-sig things that are out there do. Um, uh, but with Gordian Envelope, uh, and QRs and URs and some of these other different types of things, it should be, you know, utterly easy for a user and they'll, and it'll be very difficult for them to, uh, to foot gun, foot gun themselves. Um, so Ken is, is involved in that. I know, um, uh, Simon, who I don't think has arrived late. I was hoping he was going to show up. He said, uh, he had a, a last minute, um, thing come up. Uh, he's doing SSKR for the, the biometric ring. Uh, so he very much cares about this uh, capability as well. So uh, we're definitely working on it. Uh, we will probably support BIP85 directly, um, but we actually think we can do a little better and, and offer it. And I think that's kind of the same thing we've got like with PSBTs and uh, legacy Bitcoin. We want to support those 
uh, if you need a legacy Bitcoin signed object for some tool, we'll be, we'll be able to provide that. Um, but then we also wanted, you know, to do it right where we have some of these other, uh, you know, uh, future capabilities that will really make lives easier for not just developers and ops people like you, but also users. So that's our goal. And we're, I feel like we've got some good architectures for this. Ken, any thoughts on um, on this one for, I mean, have you looked at uh, the, the um, you know, this uh, key derivation? Key derivation to back to yeah. Sequence. We we actually have BIP eighty five support coming out in the next update, um, so that's coming. And we also just have a PR out. I put a comment in the the chat there. But we have a PR out about um, derivation path, multiple derivation paths for Noster keys um, yeah. that we're also supporting with um, with a wallet and with Passport right now. So um, cool. So that's definitely um, you know stuff we want to support. Uh, again, you know there, are, you know pros and cons. You know each of these additional Noster keys you can't really prove were associated with the original Noster key, and that can be an advantage in some scenarios. Um, and but there are also other kinds of ways we can offer cryptographic proofs to to, to yeah. demonstrate the association. I feel like Noster is an area though where it's like just evolving so quickly. Um, like now is a great time to get in if you have value to add there because they're moving quickly and breaking things and you know like the very first version of this there was only like one fixed derivation path for for a, a noster key it's like okay well that doesn't seem good yeah. <laughs> because it is your your key is, is compromised you're kind of toast and that's already happened to somebody on our team so uh, this is kind of what the the source of this pr was was being frustrated with that yeah so um, that's exactly those things. I mean, this and this is very related to my problem with, for instance, the lesson that we're learning from Ethereum, which they only do one key derivation for your account key in, in Ethereum. So that means you're using the same account key for authenticating your website as you are for signing your transaction. And, you know, we're kind of repeating that in, um, uh, oh, also, um, you know, your you know, Christopher A. ETH ENS name uses that same key. Uh, we're trying to eliminate that problem by having multiple keys and doing it right and having proofs between those things that are necessary so we can do key rotation. And we've been saying for five years that we need to do this. We need to allow people to rotate keys. I mean, even, uh, you know, ITF has been saying, you know, keys should not be, you know, long-term. They need to be uh, you know, rotated uh, on a regular basis as a general practice. I mean, NISC says this, but then we keep on writing protocols that rely on, um, you know, a persistent public key that can't be rotated. So we've, you know, somehow we've got to make this easier for everybody. And that's kind of what the mission of blockchain commons is and why, you know, we want to get more, you know, people, uh, you know, contributing not only as, you uh, as uh, you know, to our code bases and using our tools, et cetera, but also financial. I mean, we need um, organizations to back us thinking about kind of these bigger problems and um, uh, and uh, you know doing it right, solving it, solving these larger problems. And key rotation is one of the biggest, especially when it's uh, you know not strictly just a Bitcoin transaction. Um, same thing I think is going to happen with. Uh, with um, uh, you know lightning node identifiers and things of that nature, you can't you know Blockstream has been using the same lightning node uh, identifier for what three years, four years now, um, and they're saying, well, we don't you know the, oh no, lightning isn't isn't an identity. Well, sorry, it's an identity. You've just you've firmly established that it's you know run by B blockchain commons. Well, if something goes wrong, how does block not blockchain, I mean, uh, Blockstream. How does Blockstream let people know, oh, you know, this new site isn't, you know, I could see somebody coming along and saying, oh, you know, Block, you know, Blockstream is rotating their key. Use our site instead. And uh, and then you go, well, wait a second. No, that's, that's a fake site. Um, how do you prove that? Well, we want solutions where you can prove that. And they're available. It's, it's, it's technically possible. We just haven't figured out how to make it easy for ops and for users. And we're going to solve that problem. Ian, Irfan, Zab, Javier, do you any other comments or questions before we close for the day? No, no, thank you. I was just willing to join, to observe, uh, as we have implemented UR ourselves. 
So, uh, yeah. Which wallet is yours again? Uh, Engrave. Oh, that's right. Right. That's... So yeah, please. Um, you know, we don't have a. Um, we don't have your details and uh, in those uh, links. Uh, yeah, and... I, I made the notes. Uh, I'll, I'll look into this. Yeah. And then, of course, we would love to have uh, you know a demo unit uh, for each of us so that we can you know continue to to test things, et cetera. We just got the latest version of Ken's uh, wallet and um, uh, some other wallets so that we can do testing and uh, try uh, to, make... to be clear, we, we don't support PSB, PSBT sets. So uh, the testing is limited. We, we support the UR uh, formats for QR codes between our mobile app and our wallets. And we are going to support PSBTs. And at that point, we might send you one, might be more uh, useful then. Sure. Cool. Well, I look forward to seeing more with you with that, and I appreciate you coming in and joining in this call. And uh, hopefully, we'll see you in upcoming meetings and uh, in the in the uh, Signal Chat and the GitHub channel. Thank you for all your work. Thank you. Okay, um, ciao, and uh, have uh, an excellent week. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Cheers. See you soon. Bye. Bye.